shoulder as I wrote, you know, you should want to be thinking of everything that we were told uh, for the Our Shared Past in the Mediterranean Project. And um, he had really been the kind of at the core of our, our thinking in this project from the very beginning. And in particular, as we launch into that strange thing called modernity, um, he will usher us into the period and so on. And um, Glenn Cole is also, we're very, very pleased to have him. I know many of you have been delving into his book. He stepped out for a moment, but we'll be right back. So, yes, there you are. <laughs> we are so pleased to have all of these scholars here this week. It's been a fantastic week. We're taping all of them, and we'll be putting them up very soon. So for your review, uh, if I can, I'll also produce some summaries. And before we start, I also want to draw your attention to the, what I mentioned yesterday at first. Um, we are seriously thinking of putting together some lesson plans out of this work, particularly using the primary sources. And if there are some who are interested in doing it for a modest, with a capital M, honorarium, but nonetheless, um, and have a chance to work with the scholars, many of them have agreed to review the work that we do. So if you would like to be one of those, um, come to me and I will sign you up and not let you go. <laughs> so, so, Terry Burke. Thank you very much. Well, once again, of course, Susan has been way too generous because, in fact, of course, the modules are really all her fault and are not mine. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I did uh, make an attempt to whisper in her ear, it is true, but fortunately, she exercised good discretion and disregarded a lot of what I had to say, which was irrelevant for our purposes here this morning. Uh, I wanted to begin by just taking a little census. How many of you are, have taught um, the, uh, the AP world? A few of you. And then how many of you teach world history otherwise? And how many of you have ever made a foray into trying to do modern Mediterranean? That's why we're all here. Okay, well, very good. So um, We have some AP European here, Joe. And the AP Europe is a big help. Right, it's a big help. And so I guess what I, the first thing I want to say as we get going is that it's that it, I, would, uh, I would recommend going to the um, World History for Soul website which if you don't know, I'm sure Susan can provide you with breadcrumbs that will allow you to follow the path and get there. Um, the the um, World History First All is, a, is an ancestor project that uh, does a whole world history curriculum. It's online, and if you don't know about it, it's a major resource. And Susan and I and Rostan and David Christian and a bunch of other classroom teachers, in the end num numbering some dozen or so, um, um, had at for about three years um, in the summers in San Diego from 2001 till 2003. And we produced the, the skeleton of this and, uh, and then carried it on from there. Now, so the, first of all, I wanted to just signal the existence of this resource. Uh, and then the second thing I wanted to do is in particular point out one key feature of, the, of this online curriculum, which is not, none of the competition has and which is a vitally important one for world historians, uh, and, uh, and namely that um, what we try to do is in, in this curriculum, which is different from the way all world history textbooks operate, is we try to actually think from a global perspective about what we call big eras, so sort of 250 or more year blocks in which things are, um, are undergoing important changes. And, uh, and each one of those then got a lesson that uh, tell, runs you through everything that's happening. And the, the one that for uh, Big Era 7, which is the relevant one for um, my discussion here today, is particularly apt for helping you uh, understand what I'm, where, where I'm coming from, what I'm trying to get at. Um, and, uh, and it was done by one of the teachers who was there. Um, and uh, and uh, I will have a little bit more to say about that in a sec. So it's the, the idea that when we get to um, the beginnings of what is fondly known as modernity, I think some of us are increasingly beginning to have qualms about just how wonderful the thing this is, um, if we had it already. Um, but nonetheless, it, 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 is, it is an historical epoch um, that is, uh, in many respects, quite different from all that has come before. And the single most important aspect of it is uh, transformations in the environment, particularly attendant to, um, on the one hand, global warming, but even more importantly, and as a, one of the drivers of global warming, uh, the fossil fuel revolution phase one, which is to say, coal and steam. Right. So the, 
So um, what we did in the Big Era uh, essays is we tried to organize things into three categories. Um, so for, for the long 19th century, um, the categories are always the same, but the categories were, uh, first of all, humans and the environment, then it's humans and other humans, and then it's humans, and I keep forgetting exactly. Ideas. Humans and ideas, or sometimes we said the world inside. Um, namely, is a, in some ways, it's a kind of a proxy for culture. And the second one, the humans and other humans, is largely where you go to find political and um, economic history. Um, and then the first one is the innovative one. And we put it first because it's a, it in many ways helps to set the stage for the innovative character of, the, of this curriculum. Uh, and if you think, so then, the, 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 so having said that, the next thing to say is that when, we're, when you're doing a global history of a 200, well in this case it's a 150 year period, um, then you've got to imagine um, that you're going to be talking about rather different things. And so initially going in, we had many misgivings. We sort of nerved ourselves up into thinking that, well, yes, okay, in, indeed it was probably a good thing to actually try and provide this sort of overarching kind of global historical framework. But on the other hand, um, our knees were shaking and we were really wondering if we could pull it off. And it's not so much for us to say that. It is indeed a rough draft of where we need to go. Um, and it was what we could do at the time, given the time we had at our disposal. Um, uh, that said, um, you would have thought that there would be perhaps less data, let's just say fewer facts, names, dates, places, et cetera, at the global level than in the ones that we as historians are much more familiar with. And that would be an incorrect assumption. There is a mass of data equal to anything that we have at other, I hate this word, but let's just use the word levels, right? <laughs> uh, which implies some kind of hierarchy, which is in some ways really not the point. It's the global perspective versus the, versus the sort of interregional um, uh, world history perspective, the thing that, that where most of us that have had prior contact with world history live and, and operate. Uh, and then there's the, is there still narrower one of national histories, right, which is the one that, is, that has been the um, bread and butter for so many historians for so long, right? But, so at the, at the global level then, um, what you see you know, under the environment are the impacts of humans on the environment and vice versa. Um, and so, so uh, and, and a lot of it then has to do with, on the one hand, those impacts, and on the other hand, has to do with human demography and migration, right? So those are very big, and they are front-loaded. And they are, in, by putting it first, one of the things we're trying to signal uh, is that they are, in many ways, drivers of what happens um, in the humans and other humans and the humans and, uh, and ideas segments, and indeed, and, uh, in, in the world that we live in, right? So human, so, demo, so it's a sort of demography first kind of an argument in a way. And it's demography in some complicated ways and sort of interacting with and, and being interacted upon um, the environment and, and, and other species indeed um, um, here below uh, who have the unfortunate um, um, situation of having to survive with us around them um, with our voracious ways. All right, so, so, so all of that said then, standing back, so I'm just setting the table by giving you the big picture, right? So let's sort of get launched here and see where we go. And we don't go anywhere, so let's try that. And let's try that forcefully. And then we'll try jumping up and down. Um, so, there we go, okay. So this is what I want to talk about today. Now, and so the first thing is your first exposure to me, so that's already a shock. Yep. Right? And, then, <laughs> and, then the, and then the second one is, um, this is gonna be conceptual, right? So this is gonna be a very, it's gonna be a more, what would we say, political science-y, social science-y kind of an approach. Because what I'm trying to capture here is the sort of common fates and fortunes of Mediterranean societies in the long 19th century in response to global vectors of change big words, right? What does all this mean? Let's just see if we can unpack it a little bit. Whoops. Why am I having this problem? Is there some easier way to do this? 
Masters. Yeah. So, here, um, so here's, we're in a basic cultural problem here, which, which is that um, I come from Mars and you guys come from Venus. Um, I come from Mac land, you guys come from really? PC land, right? And so it's this little sort of, the things that come readily to hand when you're teaching a lifetime doing PowerPoints don't come that ready to hand here. So I have this conceit of what I call the Mediterranean Laboratory. So the Mediterranean is in some ways the first place that the Industrial Revolution, the Democratic Revolution, the old sort of dual revolution that Hobsbawm gave us way back in the 50s, and in some ways still provides a sort of rough and ready yardstick for two of the main transformations that, are, that affect humans everywhere on the globe. But it's exported to the Mediterranean first, I would argue, in some respects. Uh, or in any event, the, the Mediterranean is a space which, which looks tantalizingly like Europe and tantalizingly or unfortunately, and particularly in the eyes of many of the pro-reform elites, not enough like Europe, right? So, it, so it's thinking about what, is, what, does the, what do the fruits of, the, of the, um, the, the, the democratic revolution and the industrial revolution look like when we get to the Mediterranean? Some of you, most of you, hopefully, have read the, my article in the Journal of World History, and if you haven't, um, shame on you, but, uh, but you, you are now by here on, hereby enjoined to go and do that, because it's a more extended argument about the particular situation of the Mediterranean as a world region in a, in, in a globe that is divided into world regions, each of which has got some, some um, tokens on the board that it is sort of, it has by birthright. It's got location, location, and location. Certainly, that's a big one for the Mediterranean. Um, it doesn't have coal. Who knew, right? So if we're trying to understand one of the one of the. I'm not doing that here, but one of the things that one can think about if we're thinking about the Mediterranean is why is the Industrial Revolution um, relatively slow to get going in the Mediterranean and relatively weaker um, and relatively more sort of dependent on El Norte. Um, and the answer is, in two words, no coal. Right, so the, so the Mediterranean doesn't have coal. I mean, large generalization, we can quibble about um, particular elements of it, but for, for the most part, it, that's a true statement. It also, in the long 19th century, has no oil that anybody knows about, or that anybody can do anything about, because none of the technologies exist. And really, in some ways, the, the second phase of the fossil fuel revolution doesn't really click in until the 1950s, certainly as far as the world is concerned. That's the way it works, even though the United States has already made fair steps in the direction of moving over to petroleum, it still continues to be a major user of coal, um, as indeed does Britain, in spite of the fact that the Royal Navy switches um, to, well, Royal Navy switches to coal in, um, um, uh, oh, whoops, I'm making an incorrect statement now, switches, what does it do? Go on, help me. <laughs> It switches to oil, I think, is what it does. Um, and, um, and, uh, and there it hangs a tail, right? And where does that oil come from? It comes from guess where? So, um, so uh, the future of the, of the Middle East part of the Mediterranean region is laid out right away. But of course, none of the people living in the long 19th century have any clue this is on the horizon. And so the lives they're living are, in some ways, lives of playing catch up with the guys in the north, particularly Britain and France and subsequently Germany. Holland, if you want to start getting down into that level of detail. Um, and, uh, and things on the whole don't work all that well. So the global context of modernity is the first thing I want to look at. But first, let's have a lovely look at this map, which seems to be the only one that everybody's using this map. And that's because you know there it is. And, and actually, maps, of the, maps of, the, of the Mediterranean are not actually as easy to come by as you think. And it does give you the geographical features. And that's a nice thing. Um, and it shows you the sort of uh, ways in which there are all, all these sort of uh, somewhat disorganized, but in the end sort of fascinating internal compartments within compartments of the Mediterranean. So it's, it is a sea of seas um, and, and not just a sea. And so it's a big space, but it's also a whole lot of little spaces that are all interconnected with one another uh, and have ecological um, sort of things that keep the peoples around the Mediterranean in contact with one another over the very long haul. 
Um, and, and we could go into that more, but I don't really have the time here because I want to move right away into the global context of modernity and to talk about the, the three main features. Here I'm calling it communications revolution. I, I, I'm not happy with that formulation, and I actually have a better one that will appear subsequently. I didn't retrofit it in this particular slide. But so, so basically, changes in the state, or what political scientists call state formation, that's one of the big things that's happening in this period. And they are largely, not entirely, but largely driven by one very large thing, which is um, the so-called military revolution. Right. And the military revolution is transformations in the art of war, which go back in some ways all the way to Soviet China, but um, which play their way out in the early modern period, particularly in Europe in such things as the wars of religion, and the Battle of Lepanto would be another aspect of that. Um, the latter phases of the Reconquista, um, where the gunners that are on the side of the, of the, of the Granadans, one of the reasons Granada holds out until the bitter end, is that it's actually, it's artillerymen are superior to those of Castile and Aragon. And at a certain point, at the very, as we're approaching endgame, a whole bunch of them defect uh, because they see that their cause is not gonna actually be successful um, and uh, join, the, join the enemy, right? And so the, so the military revolution is in Iberia already, although usually people who talk about the military revolution, who are those people? Well, Jeffrey Parker is one that you might readily be able to access as a book uh, under that title. There's an enormous scholarly literature that bears on this, which I will not bore you with. Um, Jeremy Black is a popularizer historian who has written a ton of books, numbers of them on the military revolution. Um, and so it's the, it's the notion that gunpowder weapons have something intrinsically important about them, which is that they can fire projectiles like, with great force over long distances with cons growing levels of accuracy, right? So, and that really changes the whole business and it means ultimately that um, guys riding around on horses with armor just are no longer in the game, right? It's just sort of the end of it. And in particular, it settles down into a bunch in the wars of religion, the wars between, between Spain and the Dutch, really. Uh, in, uh, in, in this is sort of the, the main thing we want to look at here. Um, the, the, the military revolution um, forces a whole series of changes in, in, uh, in the way in which the different combatants deal with one another. So fortifications would be one, so, uh, logistics is another one, a very big one. So getting more systematic, more organized. Uh, things like uh, uh, close order drill and getting increasingly sort of focused and organized in um, directing cavalry and the role, where does the cavalry fit into the mix when you have artillery and so on at your beck and call. So all of these huge questions are all sort of sitting there. And they get rolled forward um, into the 19th century where they get deployed um, in, um, in particular, the struggle around the French Revolution and subsequently ending with Napoleon. Right? So there's a, all of that's going on. And this is a major driver all over the planet. The Mediterranean gets it right in the teeth. Right, and that's, a, that's something that needs to be thought about, and it does in slightly different ways. And so, in the way in which I'm going to proceed from here on in, I, I like to drive, uh, uh, divide the Mediterranean into three spaces, and shame on me, they're somewhat culturally driven, and therefore they're essentialists, and I am from Santa Cruz, and yes, I have been vaccinated, and I know this is politically incorrect, <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm going to do it, right? <laughs> and so, because I'm going to call them Latin Europe, where is Latin Europe? Well, it's Portugal, Spain, France, and Italy. Italy is, of course, a geographical location. It is not a country at this point. Uh, indeed, it is a congeries of different countries and kingdoms and so on, many of which, but not all of which, are subsumed um, in the Habsburg Empire. Then there are the Papal States, whatever that is, um, and the two Sicilies, and we could continue. Right, so, there, so that's Latin Europe. And then there's what I'm going to call Orthodox Europe, by which I mean Orthodox Christian Europe, which when we set the stage and start things moving in the long 19th century, really isn't, isn't, has no, doesn't know what it's doing, because it isn't an it, right? It's not, it's not a player. Um, gradually, as things change, and as we get to um, people beginning to have new ideas about 
themselves and their relationship to their polity, which are connected to their with the quiver in his voice. Because what the heck is ethnicity? So the way Americans talk about it, they usually mean race. But that's, strictly speaking, not in play here. So then we have two other options. It's important to insist on two. People who teach Middle Eastern history know for a fact that you can't just say that linguistic uh, and religious ethnicity are the same thing. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. A lot of, a lot of Greeks are Muslim, a lot of Turks are Orthodox. Go figure, right? So it's just, it, it's the way, you know, nobody said it was going to be easy, right? So that's just the way it plays out. So the Ottoman, so then there's the, most, the third bit is the Muslim Mediterranean, most of which, when we start the cameras uh, for this particular exercise, um, it consists of the Ottoman Empire, the territories of the Ottoman Empire, some of which are rather more closely integrated into, um, um, you know, the sort of the spinning of webs coming out of Istanbul, and others of which, as we saw yesterday, like Tunisia, Algeria, um, and, uh, and Libya, are rather more peripheral to those activities. Right. So the, and then there's Morocco, and I am a, a Moroccan historian, and so I could weep um, for the singularity of Morocco, but I will not. Um, so, um, so that's our game board, right? And so, so then what I'm going to argue is that the, these changes, the military revolution being one of them, impact these different areas differently. But in some ways, if you stand back two steps, more or less the same, right? So that is from the world historical perspective that you can begin to see a Mediterranean game board as not a space of difference, but a space of, if not uniformity, then of some kind of really interesting, um, largely similar patterns of response to changes that are coming out of Northwestern Europe and are coming that are global changes. All right. So pause. Some of you are sitting there, if you know anything at all about the military revolution, and you're going, naughty, naughty, mustn't do. He forgot to tell us that it's really something else it's re because this is actually the real driver, and it's the fiscal military revolution. Because you're going to have expensive toys, and their cost is going to go up, 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 and you need more and more of them because they are oh so wonderful to have. Oh my God, give me a drone. Um, then you need to be able to pay for them. How, how are we going to find a way to sucker the citizens into paying? Right? Well, we don't yet have citizens, so we have subjects. Say, if we have subjects, part of the transformation that goes on is from subjecthood to citizenship, right? And that, that involves getting some buy-in from the human beings who inhabit the tax-paying um, categories, uh, whoever it is that's having the, having the army, right? So conveying this to students may be a little difficult. I'm not sure what your grade level is like or what your students are like. But I think if you stand back from it a little bit, you just say, look, this is what's going on. Everybody has to contend with warfare. Warfare is expensive. And the state needs to be able to pay for it, right? Simple, right? So th then, there's the, then there's the Industrial Revolution. I'm not going to really talk about that today because it's already too much on the table and I'm already running over time right now. Um, um, but suffice to say that the Industrial Revolution is really several different things from my perspective and not necessarily uh, agreed to by many others. Um, I wrote, I co-edited a book with somebody named um, um, Anyway, uh, a, a book called The Environment and World History, right, which I co-edited with somebody who remained nameless because it was <laughs> all too common, unfortunately, uh, in my demographic. And I will come up with his name in a moment because he's a dear friend. Right? So in any event, The Environment and World History, and, and my essay is on energy in world history. And so what I began thinking after reading somebody called E.A. Wrigley, who was an historian of the of, um, the British Industrial Revolution, particularly the Agricultural Revolution, is that actually what we call the Industrial Revolution is really several different things. And so one of them is continual mechanical transformations that will increase levels of efficiency in doing things. So if you look at the old spinning jenny or any of the other things that all of you that are world historians run before your students uh, all the time, right? all of these special new things that are, allow, particularly in textile mills, um, workers to save time and bosses to save on the cost of workers because now they have machines that can do what workers used to have to do. Right? 
right? So it's a it's a insidious sort of uh, uh, particular little loop, um, but it does really work, right? So the so technological transformations are devised for the solar energy regime, right? Or what Ridley calls the organic regime, and uh, and so that means nobody knows about steam power. They know about coal, but coal is exclusively used in this period for heat energy. It's not, nobody, steam engine has not been invented, right? And that really, and the steam engine is a very bulky instrument, uh, and, uh, and the first steam engines, uh, are, which are located in the very bottom of mine shafts, have the principal function of pumping the water out. Because if you're a miner, the, the, your, your friend is not water. Um, if you're a Californian, as I am, you really want to have water, right? We are in a stage three drought right now. So, um, but so if you're if you are um, um, if you are a miner, you need this thing. Even at two percent efficiency, it's altogether better than a bunch of guys carrying a bunch of pails um, up to the top of a uh, 450 foot ladder, right? So how otherwise are we going to get the bloody water out of here? Otherwise, we just have to abandon the mine, right? So. So the, so the Industrial Revolution then is an energetic revolution, but it's an energetic revolution that cannot be thought of apart from steam power. So, and, 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 and apart from coal. So coal is known, coal is used. It's not in, coal's role in the economy is not insignificant. So it's used, it's used to bake bricks, it's used to, um, to uh, cook the vats of dye stuffs that are used to color cloth during the incipient phases of the textile revolution. Um, it's used to, ah, uh, something more useful, make beer, right? Um, make bricks. Um, so, so heat energy can be used in that fashion, but that's, we, and humans could have gone on that way, and it does scooch us up so we're getting a little bit more bounce to the ounce um, out, of, uh, out of our um, environment than we were previously, but it's not steam power, right? And so steam power is the, is the huge, breakthrough that utterly transforms things. Let's go back to phase one of the, when we were, uh, my first opening remarks about the Mediterranean, the land of no coal. Okay, so we could say that the reason the Mediterranean is slow to develop or has somewhat thwarted, blocked paths to development has to do with one very simple thing, no coal. Um, which means it has to be imported at considerable expense uh, and every, so then you're, you're in a situation, you know, you, the, the prospective entrepreneur, uh, are in a situation where you're always dependent on people in places where coal is plentiful to be able to supply you at a price you can afford, right? So that's, so that's definitely, which means they've got you by the short hairs, basically. So, so, the, uh, the, so the energetic revolution then is, a, is something complicated that has to be worked through. The world economy and capitalism is the other aspect of that. So what, what is capitalism? So capitalism is, some, in some ways, it's colonies and coal. Right? So, that, so, uh, and, um, so colonies, because what, what Europe needs is access to raw materials. And there's a complicated argument, which I can't break down here, except that to say things like, um, if, the, Medi the Mediterranean doesn't have coal. If it needed to have coal, uh, some source of energy to make up for its absence of coal, it would principally have to go to wood, right? Uh, and if it was going to go to wood, then it doesn't have anything like enough wood because anybody that knows two cents about the Mediterranean knows that already the Mediterranean forests were considerably depleted by Greek times, certainly by Roman times. And so, so the the energetic sort of base for the, the solar energy um, um, uh, systems have not yet been invented. Wind power is not something that is particularly useful in the Mediterranean. W water power, rather more so. I mean, actually, on my on my uh, my computer on the de on the desktop, I have a photo uh, that I took in better times uh, in the city of Hama of the great big water wheels um, that are there. So there's this, so definitely water power is an important element in um, the industrialization, or the proto-industrialization, perhaps, since it's been there for millennia, right, uh, in um, the Mediterranean. Right, so the world economy and, and, and state formation are two big drivers, and the Mediterranean has to try and deal with that. 
And then there's this thing that is called here, annoyingly to my taste, communications revolution, which I want to call cultural revolution. Not that this um, keeps the wolf away from the door, because then I have to get into a bunch of complex sort of unpackings, um, which uh, involve, on the one hand, technological changes, right? So changes, if, 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 if we can do it in shorthand, the invention of the, steel, the steamship and the railroad, right? But which, all of which have longer backstories, taking us back to the, the oceanic voyages of Columbus and Alaska and Panama and so on, right? So the whole the age of sail, the tweakings with sailing technology, all of that sort of comes, brings us up to um, the long 19th century. Um, and then you have other, uh, so what that does is really, basically, it's, sort of, it's an accelerator of the spread of people, ideas, and goods around the world. But it's, but, and, and, and that's important. And, and, uh, and, and, and what is a, a sailing ship, after all, except a factory for the production of motion, right? A factory with very stringent requirements on the performance of its labor system, the, the sailors because they have to be up 24 hours a day, right, in ships, right? So that's the watches. Um, and because the, sh the ship has to always be being manned and being, being made to do what it wants, what the helmsman wants it to do. Uh, and, and so um, the, there's a, a technological thing dealing with wind power that is, is fundamental to really understanding that transformation. By the time we get to steam power, we don't need the wind anymore. Who cares about the wind? Um, and now we're in another era altogether. So, so the, this accelerator of the movement of goods, ideas, and people um, is something that has, goes all the way back in human history. So this is not something that just is cropping up now, but particular manifestations that are cropping up now, railroad and steam power, just to stand in for, uh, and, and, and steam ships, rather, are, are, are a manifestation of the larger changes um, involved. Um, then there are the actual sort of cultural ones cultural changes, which have very much to do with European enlightenment, right? and the coruscating sort of impact of it on all belief systems. And I'll get to that in a second, but I wanted to mention it. And finally, I wanted to mention briefly here, some of you may have come across um, this idea, which in some ways I'm still not fully on board for, but it does, in a shorthand way, give us something that students might find interesting. And it's what Benedict Anderson, an anthropologist of nationalism, among other things, calls print capitalism, and it's kind of awkward formulation, but what he's trying to drive at here is the, the newspaper, the book, printing for a market, a market that assumes the existence of increasingly num increasing numbers of literate people, right? So literacy is folded into this, growing literacy, uh, and it has all sorts of manifestations. So Bibles can get printed and disseminated around in vernacular languages, um, but so can the thoughts of Voltaire and Don Bach. Uh, the militant atheists of the French Enlightenment, right? So it's a, it creates a whole different playing field. It's a little bit like the, the transformations that we're experiencing right now um, with um, uh, the internet and the iPhone and you know, Twitter and all the other sort of aspects, right? So it's a completely, it demo radically democratizes and, and, and sort of at the same time takes away the authority of teachers. Ooh, we don't like that, right? So, um, because anybody, once taught to read, anybody can read any book, right? They can spend their entire time on the internet looking at porn, or the shopping channel, or who knows what, you know? So, I mean, the mind boggles at what you can waste your time doing. Um, and that's always been there, and print allowed, afforded all sorts of opportunities of the same kind. All right, so enough of all of that. And then the interactive nature of this needs not perhaps to be mentioned, although I just did. So, so that uh, we're still in the warm-up. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, um, so um, unity of the Mediterranean. And if you read my if you read my piece, I say much more about that. Maybe I'll just let you look at these things and think about them for a moment. But the Mediterranean is, in many ways, particularly when viewed from China, one space. It's not multiple spaces. Um, and my. Abrahamic monotheism is, is a religion with many side chapels, right, of which Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are the three principal ones, and then those come in multiple different forms and variants. <coughs> and then if you want to get a little bit more sticky, you could throw in, as Marshall Hodgson does, one of the inventors of the kind of world history that, that I follow, um, on Zoroastrianism, which is another kind of monotheism minus the Abraham part. Um, and so there's 
something about West Asia which makes it very different from South Asia, where we don't have one god, um, where, and where we, you know, just the whole the, the, the concept of the of what what the believer is doing here below and the struggles that the believer is having in order to get into some final resting place, um, which is divine and which is not entirely unlike spaces imagined in South Asia or indeed even in East Asia. Right? So. Um, but, it's, but the Mediterranean is actually a rather different place. Um, all right, so enough of that. And then Greek thought and Roman law, of course, are hardy um, perennials. Uh, and they, well, they can be found in lots of different places. And so just as a for instance, um, if you know a little bit about Islam and Islamic law as a Sharia, uh, you may also then know that embedded in it is a whole bunch of Roman law. So, which resurfaces under the name under, in the Ottoman domain of Kanun, right? So, but the, but if, but there also are actually in the Sharia, Kanun is more state law, right? Uh, what the state wants to do, the parts of law that it wants to control. But it also has is connected uh, semantically to canon law, right? So canon law draws out of Roman law, right? So there's a way in which even the Sharia, which we think of as being, oh my God, it's other, is really not. Right? It's part of this family of discourse. It's a somewhat different take, but it had many of the same presuppositions. Right. So that's your cultural lesson for the day. And then, so then there's the then there's the the importance of world history, which is again, why are we doing all of this? We're doing this because world history is a powerful tool, intellectual tool, to enable to empower students and all others who come under its thrall um, to perceive patterns where they had not previously seen them. And so why are we doing the Mediterranean? We're doing the Mediterranean because it looks like the most unpromising place you could possibly pick to you try and apply world history. Because it looks like the space of otherness and civilizational discontents and who knows what all, right? Where it's, you know, of course they're not the same. I mean, they've been killing each other for all these years. But actually they have. And a part of what we've been, you guys have been learning in the first several days of this is in fact the past history of the Mediterranean is a much different one than the one that is generally portrayed in terms of relations be between and across um, um, religious um, groupings. And so we did this already, and so um, dandy for us. Um, and I'll give you one, two, three, four, five, who I'm gone. Um, and then here's this thing I call the communications revolution. This is, I'm still messing with the, how I want to present this, but. Oceanic communications, land communications, but also print capitalism um, and, 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 and the dissemination of ideas, right? So in the end, it's a sort of software hardware thing. We can think of the, and, and you know, things that spread ideas, uh, things that they take on, make it possible to package them and move them around, books, newspapers. Um, but, but then the ideas themselves also, right? And, that, and which have um, powerful um, um, corrosive effects. Right, so, so now we're up, to, we're trembling on the brink of the long 19th century. Alas, we're still not there. So um, I'm gonna do the thing that historians always do, which is historic. If you've been messing around with, with history, this is not gonna come as a shock to you. You can't ever start where you're saying everything is a regress, right? I mean, already I've been back to the Greeks, right? Multiple times. And so, because continuities are so important, change is important too, and so the juggle in being an historian is helping students to understand that on the one hand, yes, it's true, things stay the same, but on the other hand, oh my God, if, you, if that's the idea you have, you are oh so wrong, right? Because they're always changing, right? And, the, and the, the thing that you have to get across is, but they change in patterned ways. And the changes are not random. The changes themselves are a particular source. And I would argue, this is not the, the way in which the World History Football Project came out, that state formation, um, uh, economic transformation and, uh, and cultural change are the three big drivers, right? Cultural change is a proxy for all these complicated things up to and including human migrations and so on. Okay, so what we see in the 18th century, this is testing your patience, I know, um, is, is because it takes us into, ter in, into terrain that nobody knows about, right? You may have an expertise on France. Ah, lucky you, but maybe you don't. Um, maybe your expertise is somewhere else in Europe, or maybe it's somewhere else in the world. Um, but it, you know, you, so your comfort zone may be more or less sort of uh, engaged here. But the one thing about this curriculum that is really different is it makes us think about 
modern, not only modern France, that's not so hard to do, modern Spain, who, who knows anything about modern Spain? Naming it, right? there aren't very many. Modern Italy, you know, right? Particularly in the long 19th century, and then back into the 18th century, what is this man doing? It's torture, right? So, so the, and so, in, if you know a little bit about Latin America, this is going to be familiar, right? Who knows about Latin America? Back to the, okay. If this were California, more hands would go up. Um, so, so, um, you're wishing for horses, beggars would ride. Um, so, the Bourbon reforms, which have nothing to do with my dad's favorite tipple, um, but has to do with the, the name of the French dynasty that is sort of trademarked these reforms as they spread around the world. And they start with Louis XIV, and with Louis XIV, the revolutions in the art of war that begin under Louis XIV, as he fully begins to assimilate and to control and to organize of the new transformations, particularly with the use not just now of siege artillery, but now with field artillery. So field artillery is maneuverable. It's what you see in, you know, in a lot of sort of pre-World War I movies where you would hitch up the horses to the cannon and you drag it over to that hill and you blast away for a while. And then you hitch up the horses and ride to some other hill before the guys can fire back to the hill. You just were off, right? So it's that kind of thing. And, and sort of learn, getting really adept at doing that and being able to do it efficiently without um, people um, having um, mishaps that they, if, with more practice, they wouldn't have, et cetera. That become, that's the Louis XIV thing. And then it's also about drill. So the, the way in which infantry are deployed and utilized, already, I mean, already back to the Greeks and Romans, of course, we've had the kinds of um, bodily control aspects of warfare. Right? So warfare is a space in which, in which you're, in which you must, in unison, move your body according to command. And when we get to modern times, it gets way more exacting. Because if you're in the classic um, square formation with, with four or five ranks of people, um, which is one of the ones that was used from French times on forward. Um, the first guys in the first row fire, and we're talking, now we're in the world of muskets here, right? And it takes you minutes to reload. So those guys fire, then they kneel down to reload. If they stand up too soon, they're going to get blasted in the back of the head by the guys behind them who are busy firing and then kneeling down until we get back to the fifth row, right? So, that, so what we have is a machine, a machine of perpetual fire, right? And that's what's been created here. So it's a, it's a, it's a stunning revolution. And it only gets more so. And so Louis XIV's France is able to rampage about Europe in the way in which it does because it has mastered this and not quite so well the funding thereof, although French Revolution, taxpayer rights, etc. What did he get wrong, right? So, there, so there's still some tweaking to be done there. But um, uh, organization of administration <coughs> begins under Louis XIV and carries forward. So the, Bur the Bourbon dynasty in its waning years from the late 17th century on forward um, are getting, and its and its administrators in particular are getting better and better at organizing the the space, the territorial space that they are in. Um, and that is what we're, where we start with the long 19th century. The Bourbon reforms are a further push in this direction. And, they, uh, and they're called that because the, in the thrusting and parrying and the um, marriage alliances and so on, for a period there, Spain actually has a, has a Bourbon um, king. And so there's, a, there's ways in which Spain gets sort of drawn into this and gets attracted by it, as does Sicily, right? So Sicily is an independent kingdom in the 18th century and starts out as being an independent kingdom that was a wholly owned subsidiary of um, Aragon, right? As in Castile and Aragon for Gertie and Izzy, right? That one. Um, <coughs> and so it's a kind of sub-imperialist thing. So while Castile is out rampaging around the world, Aragon is rampaging around Italy, right? You can think of it that way. And then things slip in and out, and it's not nearly so tidy as I'm portraying, because who will Sicily is something that is subject to change without notice. And it's oh so annoying, and there is no real Italy, and indeed, with all of these, the, the rampaging that is going on in Italy, and France invading Italy and fighting against um, the, the Spanish in Italy, um, poor Italy um, gets knocked back several pegs. Right? So it, 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 those, war, those wars are not good ones for Florence and Venice and Genoa. 
Right, so by the Bourbon Reform time, 18th century, this is after that stuff has gone on. Um, Italy is still a mess, uh, still divided into multiple different polities of different kinds, um, and mostly still very much in the grip of the, of the Austrian Empire, the Austrian Habsburgs. So it's in an, it's, it, is, it, is a, it is an imperial possession, and, um, and, it, and it is not yet fully conscious, except for the Prussian view, that it even is a place called Italy. So Italians famously do not speak Italian. Um, and, you know, um, Mazzini, the, the, one of the inventors of uh, Italian nationalism, said after they finally pulled it off in 1864, he says, well, we've invented Italy, now we must invent, invent Italians. <laughs> uh, and so, and which is indeed part of the problem, right? And so, so, um, so that's a long, long cultural work. So, so the, the Bourbon reforms then, coming to Italy, particularly Sicily, Spain, and Portugal, are a, a sort of a, a, a heady moment in which um, the, the European elites of those uh, spaces are, are um, for a moment, have dreams of power and dreams that they will be able to import these reforms smoothly uh, and without uh, any sort of problematic blowbacks. Well, that doesn't work out. Because the very first thing that happens is, as they're starting to try and get people to um, pay more taxes more systematically, is they have to begin to eliminate all those tax loopholes. Oh my God! Right? So aristocrats, do they pay tax? Not so much. They're all corporations based in Bermuda. No, they, they, they have they have you know they have ways of escaping taxes. It's amazing how the, you know the two percent always figure out a way to do this. But in any event, they, there it is, right? And, and the church the same. So the church lands are not taxed. This is not England, you know. And um, Henry VIII has not yet come to Spain. And so the church lands are held by the church. And they are off the, ta the tax books. And so the church collects, collects um, rents from its peasants. And it collects contributions from its faithful. And it can do with it as it pleases, right? And it doesn't have to say buy or leave to anybody in the, in the kingdom. So the, the Bourbon reforms provoke this blowback from the allies who are in support of the old vested interest tax system, um, namely the aristocrats, their friends in, uh, and conchos in court, uh, and in particular the church and the higher ranks of the, of the church who stand to see their diet significantly impacted if these reforms go through. Right. So, so, there, so brewing here is a struggle between church and state, which will increasingly become more and more important, not only in the 18th century, but on into the 19th century, right? And constitutes one of the major reasons why the importation of this reform package is so problematic. Again, Latin America, the Bourbon reforms are, are introduced by Spain and subsequently by Portugal in its domains, in Brazil primarily, um, in Latin America as a way of we got to tighten the screws, we got to get more taxes coming in more regularly. We need we got to put close the holes in the hose so that the, you know the, well, the revenues go straight to where they're supposed to go, um, and so on. So it's that kind of a that kind of a, a, a reform system, and 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 now everything has to happen because of what's driving this culturally science efficiency. We need to figure out a way. So that when we say do this, there people know that they do A, then they do B, then they do C. They don't do C first and then B and then A, or they don't skip steps. They do it the way they're goddamn told. Right? Um, and so getting getting administrators to do that proves to be difficult. P.S. Right. So in the time of Louis XIV, actually in the time of the French Revolution, it takes the news of the French Revolution 17 days to be sent from Paris to Toulouse. So southwestern France, right? So we're not, so we, again, we have to fundamentally understand the way in which space operates um, in, as a kind of, so, uh, as creating spaces for, for administrators and others to just sort of go, well, I'll get to that in a while. You know, no, no rush, right? Maybe, some, maybe there'll be a revolution or that clique will be out and, you know, a month from now we'll get another notice saying, Oh, cancel that! We're now, you know, we've now taken over, and we're not doing the reforms anymore. So you can always, so, anyways, there's 
the control rod is not yet firmly in place, right? That's part of the permanent reform thing. But one of the vectors of it in, in, uh, in Italy, France, and, uh, sorry, Italy's, well, actually, Italy, France, Spain, and Portugal, is that it turns into a let's get rid of the damn Jesuits. Right? So the judge, so it's anti Jesuit. Right? So the Jesuits, I did not go to a Jesuit school, um, the, uh, the, the Jesuits um, are seen as being the major problem because they are in thick with the aristocrats and they're in thick with the church grandees and they are also clever and they have their their cunning ways and so they they are not on board for the emerging reforms of the enlightenment but they have their sort of ways of thinking clearly and rationally and so on and that is a real enemy uh, in, in the, on the side of the old order right? so that's the so the Jesuits have got to be turfed out and the same thing happens in Latin America Right, so again, chase the goddamn Jesuits out, it becomes the theme. Um, and that doesn't necessarily do it either. All right, so, so actually, well, I'm gonna just, let's just leave it here because I gotta roll. Um, so, so pause, and this slide is slightly misplaced, but um, it really could come up almost anyway, anywhere. So, the, so in the, these transformations, in the Bourbon times, we're not having nationalism, but now we're trembling on the brink of the long 19th century, and the, this is sort of a fundamental over, overview kind of thing. So nationalism, we have to then begin to make space in our heads and, and to our students for what a powerful, sort of corrosive force nationalism is. It just completely scatters everybody's hand of cards, right? Because you think you are running and playing one game, and then a bunch of people suddenly change their idea, and they think, who are you, Kimasabi? How can we, you know, we're here, you know, we speak Greek. You're, you're the Ottoman Emperor, and you're one of his lackeys. Um, we don't owe you anything. We're Greek. We're proud. We're the descendants of the ancient Greeks, you know, and out of our way, we're coming through, right? So the so Greek nationalism, this nationalism of the Balkans in general, all the Christian um, groups of the Balkans, most of whom are Orthodox, although some annoyingly are not. Um, uh, are also then part of this. In Italy, here we are again. In it, so this, this is something that happens particularly in the empires, the Ottoman Empire and the Habsburg Empire. So the Italians, the Italian countries of Italian different peoples in this space called Italy, um, are gradually persuaded, not without a whole lot of regret and backward glances, that they, it might be a good idea to think of themselves as being Italian, whatever that might mean, right? Because it's a way of getting the goddamn Habsburgs on our back, right? So, so nationalism becomes a kind of a pry bar that allows space for the thinking of thoughts that had not previously been possible. And those thoughts have to do with personal identity, the nature of one's identity as being part of a polity that is defined in some kind of ethno-national way which religion may or may not often is, a component, right? Not so much the case in Iberia, because this is where doing this, you know, the social laboratory of Mediterranean is really interesting, because pre-existing from late medieval times in Spain and, and particularly, there are major pockets of groups that speak other languages, notably the Basque and the Catalan, but that's not a problem to the Spanish, right? So mostly, you know, population, exceptions and I'll point to one in a minute, but so the Basque and the Catalan have their own parliaments, right, that are part of a, a part of a more um, uh, sort of a different system of organization in which they have some voice in, in, in their self-government. They don't just have to sit, accept what is said um, in Madrid, right. So, so in that sense, the Spanish history is one in which there is ethnic difference. Um, but not religious difference, because they got rid of all those people, right? the Muslims and Jews. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a different game board than the Ottoman Empire, which is nothing but difference. Right? So if you're thinking about the Mediterranean, that's, a, that's an interesting contrast to reach for. So I'm, just, I'm trying to set something up here. Um, OK. So, so Charles III starts out actually, and this is the thing, when, it, when you start doing this, I, I taught a lecture class four or five times now on the modern Mediterranean, actually from 1492 to 1942, 
this is one of your sort of, you know, I'm a senior teacher, right? And so I can decide what I want to do. And so um, I thought, well, it would be nifty to do the Mediterranean. Let's start with, the, you know, the end of the Reconquista. So many things are in play in 1492. And let's go take it as far as we can go. So I thought, where are we going to end? I said, well, 1942. And 1942, you go, what are you smoking? This is weird. Right? And so 1942, I was just, I'm sorry, I'm addicted to palindromes, and I'll accept a numerical one if it's forced upon me. Right? So 1942, I thought, oh, cool, right? Well, let's, let's go with that, right? And so then I, the, the more I, get, I did this, I began to realize 1942 is brilliant. The US Navy enters the Mediterranean and resets the clock of the Mediterranean for the rest of the 20th century on up, right? So 1942 actually is not a bad date. Who knew? I was just making a feeble joke. Um, all right, so you never know what your subconscious is doing when you're making feeble jokes. So Carlos III starts out in Sicily as the king of Sicily, and then through a complicated series of events, finds himself on the throne of Spain. And Sicily is actually the place that the Roman reforms are first introduced. And then, by contagion, and because the monarch of Sicily has not changed chairs, um, he goes over to, to Spain and introduces them there. And then subsequently, another person who some of you have heard by, heard about the Marquis of Pombal, P-O-M-B-A-L, who's a man who, among other things, is credited with rebuilding Lisbon after the Lisbon earthquake um, in the 1770s. Um, is, uh, and, and he is the one who pushes those reforms into uh, the Brazilian possessions of the Portuguese crown. Right, so, so you've got all three of these, and they're all connected with one another, and they're all on French time. Right? They're all thinking French thoughts about how do you maximize you know, tax revenues, how do you get your administrators to do what they're supposed to, how do you find ways of um, plucking the goose without killing it, how do you find ways of getting um, um, tax forms and so on away from the Jesuits and away from the aristocrats so that everybody is paying taxes, right? So that, that's, the, that's the, the, the operative thing. And that, and, and that is already, as I'm saying, that kicks up this, the, all the defenders of the Jesuits are right there saying, oh, my, over my dead body, you're not going to do that. And then the defenders of the church besides, and then the defenders of the, of the military part of the old order were saying, I have to do Hub 2-3? I'm not doing no Hub 2-3, right? That's crazy. That's stupid. Look at those guys, they're ridiculous. Why can't they be gentlemen, right? What happened to warfare? It used to be a gentleman's sport. And now, you know, some idiot child with a gun can blow me away. And he hasn't done it, all the sort of riding around in armor and stuff that I've done. And, uh, and it's crazy. All right, so ineluctably, we go on. And we discover that change, the block, there's a block path to change in the 18th century. So the Bourbon reforms, as we get up to the age of the French Revolution, we're not going anywhere. Um, because they're basically stalemate. So the forces on the side of the of reform are blocked by the forces who really, really, really don't want there to be reforms. What's going on in the Ottoman Empire? Well, the Ottoman Empire, this is not widely recognized, but the Ottoman Empire has, in a way, its, its own reform era, which is called, otherwise, the Tulip Age, which is the reign of Ottoman III, 1703 to 1730, are our dates. Um, and um, he and his and his um, you know senior viziers and um, yeah. governors. Eighteen oh three. Eighteen oh three. Yeah. Seventeen. Seventeen oh three. Yeah. Seventeen thirty. Oh, the other way around. Yeah. All right. So the yeah. pure historian thing. Time traveling is easy. Sometimes things go backwards. Sometimes things go backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Naughty me. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. All right. So so any event. Um, I love these gotcha moments. Um, so um, there's a so so there, there is the the tulip age and the, behind it, although mostly the scholarship on this, I am told, exists in Turkish and not so much in other languages, um, says that they too are introducing French style military reforms because they are beginning to get pushed around a little bit by the Austrians, because um, Prince Eugene of Savoy, who was an Austrian, believe it or not, um, Savoy is nowhere near Vienna. Um, was, but he was he was an officer under Louis XIV, and he learns about up to three four, and he learns about field artillery and the new cavalry formations and so on. So when he comes to Austria, 
the Austrians get on French time too, and the Ottomans are going, oh, not a good deal. 1699, Peace of Karlowitz, the first time that the Ottomans are actually defeated um, by one of their European nearby enemies. Right? And so, so this is an occasion about this. Long story short, for for reasons that are entirely conjunctural, that is to say, just the moment it happened in is why it happened. Um, there is a big revolution in 1730, which is mostly not known to anybody. Now it's beginning to creep into the textbooks, but for a long time it was not in the textbooks at all, which is, which is the 1730 revolution, the revolution of Petrona Halil, as he's called. Um, and um, Petrona being the name of a um, Ottoman naval vessel that he was um, uh, a sailor on. Right? So he says that his buddies call him that. It's like his name. Um, and so, and he, he and a bunch of his demobilized vet buddies hanging around in Istanbul after the Austrian war, um, they get to grousing and deciding that things are just going a very bad way and they can't take it and there are all these new, new reforms that are being introduced that make it harder and harder for the guilds to be able to operate as they used to do and so there's a lot of worker protest stuff that's part of this and other elements begin to pick it up too. Uh, final thing, there's a this big revolution. And, it, and they actually succeed in killing the Red Vizier, his major his brother in law, major buddy, um, hit and chief collaborator in these reforms, and the king. Pearl Lama III doesn't make it through either. Right? And others, right, in the higher, higher ranks. They convince the Janissaries to join them, which was a, that was an astounding thing. The Janissaries are like the Marines, right? And they have their own esprit de corps and their own way of, of being, and they're inviolable, and you know, you just don't mess with them, right? And somehow these demobilized vets, think of it, the demobilized vets taking over in Washington and getting the Marines to join them, that's your thought experiment, right? So it's just like out of nowhere, everybody's going, what? They did what? How can this be? Can't we just make them go away? No, you can't, right? And so for the next five months, there's this stemway. And, and then there's another upsurge in 1731 in March. Um, as the rebels make one more effort, because by this time the, the guys on top are beginning to figure out some kind of ways of dividing the rebel coalition and so on. But what they do in the process is inadvertently, entirely inadvertently, is they provoke an alliance between the Janissaries and the Ulama. And the Janissary Ulama alliance will govern the politics of the Ottoman Empire until 1826, which is the date of what's called sardonically maybe, the auspicious event, right? The auspicious event is when a modern trained army um, is brought in, trained under a new sultan named Mahmoud II, or a century later, right? we're in the 19th century, is brought in, and the janissaries are, are, are told to sort of, uh, you know, get in parade formation and come on out, and they do, and the, and the guys the guys with the new fancy equipment and uniforms and hopping and tooling and three and so on, boom down end of Janissary and Ulama alliance. Easy peasy, right? A little bloody, but it does work, right? And, and so, and that's when the reform thing changes for the Ottoman Empire. And after that will be the Tanzimat, right? I'm gonna fly because I have 10 minutes or something, so. But there is a block load, so there's a block load of change in Latin Europe due to the church state thing. In some ways you could say the Janissary and Ulama alliance is a version of a kind of church state thing too, even though um, believe it or not, kind of isn't in the Ottoman Empire, really is in Spain. But that aside, it, it's sort of, right? Okay, so the French Revolution comes to the Mediterranean. Uh, it means that French reforms are introduced into Italy and Spain. That's a point of a gun. French bayonets come and they say, We're introducing reforms. You guys have been messing around trying to introduce some reforms. You haven't done it. This is Napoleon and, and his family and others. And so, they make a big effort to try and do that. And that product produces a lot of blowback. And the word guerrilla, guerrilla, enters the language. This is the first time it's used. Uh, and this is the popular uprising against these reforms and against the French who are invading our land and, uh, and using locals to introduce things for their own um, particular reasons. And so the, the old, the church state people in Spain that had been on board or rather have been opposed to the French reforms, are, when they see the French coming in, they're going, oh, what do we do? 
And so they decide, England, that's what we'll do. And so the British intervene, and the British support the church state people in Spain and Portugal, right? subsequently in Italy too. Right? So, is the, so, so after the French Revolution goes away, what, what's the state of play? The state of play is there's, uh, there, now we have a game board in which they still haven't solved the, the problem because each side is tainted by the fact that it used, the, it used outsiders to advance its, its interests. Right? So everybody can point to the French reform and say, yeah, but we wouldn't have these if Napoleon hadn't come messing around in our affairs. On the other hand, the reformers can say, yeah, and we wouldn't have had the church state people being back in the saddle again if it hadn't been for the damn British coming in. So each of them has been sort of compromised in this civil war, this ongoing episodic civil war that Erebus goes away and Erebus takes different forms. And it can, this mess continues throughout the whole 19th century in Spain, right? It's just with different participants, but and then the liberals split the pro-reform people. Some of the pro-reform people say, well, maybe we can do a deal with something a little bit like Iraq. Um, do a deal with the church state people um, and uh, kind of sort of do some reforms that they might sort of let us do. And maybe after that, maybe they'll see the rightness of our cause and they'll allow us to go further. No, no, right. So, so we go all the way up to you know the 20th century when we finally have the Spanish Revolution and which ends up in the Spanish Civil War, which ends up in a mess, right? So the game's still not solved, but just to sort of, I'm gonna tether that on the side of the thing. For, for Muslims, it's Napoleon actually goes in a page around the Mediterranean, not just to Spain and Italy and, and, uh, and Portugal, but he also goes to Egypt. And so, and so that sets off many a bell and creates many a problem. But ultimately, the French, French model of reform comes out of the, of the wars of the French Revolution and Napoleon with a sort of enhanced position, at least amongst reformers, amongst church state people, not so much, right? Um, and there are new political dynamics. Reform is sort of, reform is not legitimate for many people. But what Napoleon does to make it all, make the medicine go down, even in France, because France is having the same problem, right? What goes on in France? First thing the revolution does is it seizes the church lands, and then it backs the currency on the basis of, of the value, the supposed value of the church lands, and it makes French clergy swear allegiance to the revolution, and that provokes a massive split, and on and on and on, right? So the, so the intricacies of the political histories of these places play a big role. What do you say to your students? Well, you can say that, that the French reforms are problematic, even in France, the point of origin, right? And that they, they force these, these coalitions to come into existence. And they prove more or less stable, although the reformers gradually, mostly, seem to be gaining ground. And, and reaction is also, and so the remaking of Europe after the suppression of Napoleon after the Hundred Days, puts a little juice into the anti-reform people. So the Bourbon dynasty comes back in France, for example. Uh, and there are efforts to shore up the, the sort of anti-Napoleonic, anti-French reform people in Iberia and in Italy. Okay. Finally, we got to begin the lecture. I'm going to have to stop. Can I, can I say four words? Um, you have, it's 20 minutes after 10, and mm -hmm. we conclude at 10.30, so. Okay, guys, I'm really sorry. It's the, so what I would recommend is see the, see the um, big era le uh, lesson for, from the World History for Soul, which is where I get this political toolbox idea. It's actually uh, Bill, who was the, the teacher I was working with, who was actually was not originally part of our, of our uh, star study. He was a teacher. Got it. All right. Get a mic. Me. There, there, there is a mic. Oh. Oh man. Oh boy. Now you tell me. Jeez. That's outrageous. Okay. So, thereby mic'd and hyped and so on, uh, we can continue. So, so basically, Bill, Bill's idea. What is Bill's last name? Ziegler. Is it Bill Ziegler? No. Susan. 
the guy, the guy who did the lesson plan for the girl of seven. Um, his name escapes me right now. I don't know. Anyway, I was just trying to get better. But, but he has this idea that, that okay, so you o open your door, and instead of finding the New York Times, Washington Post, local newspaper, sitting on your doorstep, you find this box. And it says on it, contents under pressure, open with caution. And, 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 and then the box is open. And then, boom, out rushes the Industrial Revolution, out rushes the French Revolution, out rushes all these, these other manifold different changes. And then sort of he uses this way of, and it works great, I think, with students. Uh, and, and, he, uh, and he uses this as a way of talking about the reforms. And there is a debate about it. It's not like somehow thrashing around in the, in the wherever it is that we are with different element, political elements not wanting to pass things, wanting to pass things, wanting to pass different things, wanting to show up the other guy, and so on, the political moment that we live in now. Um, it was, there were somewhat clearer lines of political combat in the 19th century, and there was a pro-reform party, there was an anti-reform party. Elements of them sometimes switched sides or sort of saw the light of the, what the opponents were saying from time to time, but they sort of pushed it on through. And what were these reforms, right? And so there, that's really, oh, you finally got to it, damn it. Right? So uh, this will be posted, right? So the, uh, there is some comfort there. So the creation, so the end of monarchy and the creation of the constitutional republic with a legislature. Legislatures, whatever legislatures do is something unprecedented. They change laws. Mostly laws are in an earlier age are there because God said they were there. These are, you know, these are the laws. Obey the law. Um, and so legislatures are there to say, well, actually, we rethought our position on that, and I don't know, gun control, that's not so important. Um, so on the other hand, all teachers ought to have guns. <laughs> Maybe AK-47s, just in case. Um, military modernization is part of this, so, so everybody has to have a modern army. If they don't have a modern army, they're going to get toppled up. Right. So it's a continuation of the physical military revolution, which reduced the number of states in Europe in the 15th century down to a you know a number of 58 or something. I mean, a number of do that all the time. You can actually look it up. That's why that name books. Um, administrative reforms. So the the fiscal part of the of the uh, of the reform project is, consists of um, um, under the French of actually getting more and more serious about well what is a state. What are the prerogatives of the state? What are the rules that govern the operation of the agents of the state? How should those agents be, be trained to perform their, their duties? Um, how can citizens, now we're in a world in which we don't have subjects, we don't have citizens, because we got rid of monarchies, now, we, you know, now, now everybody is a, is, a, is a citizen, that means they have buy-in, that means they are electors, they can vote for legislatures, they can vote for republics, and they can take a role in constitutional conventions, if they're lucky, um, and get to have a say in the framing of the, of the larger legal edifice in, that they inhabit. Is that a hand raised, or are you just waiting to me? OK. <laughs> so then there's legal reforms, right? And so a whole bunch of modern laws. So previously, places like France or Spain were a jumble of all sorts of different laws that the, you know, the Lord said, this is the law, or the local Cortes, the local Parlement decided that this is the law here, or the church says this, and the town council says that, or what the hell is the goddamn law, right? So what the state does is it says, it's clear what the law is. The law is what we say it is, right? Anybody who says different is wrong, right? So that's, so it's bringing that kind of focus. And why are we doing all this? We're doing this because science and reason say this is the most efficient way to do it. So efficiency, social utility is another principle. You know, in the interest, it's in the interest of society as a whole that we put in sewers to take away sewage, for example. They don't get to that in a while, but I mean that would be an example, a pretty obvious example. So educational reforms at the top. So what does Napoleon do? So here's here's where Napoleon is juggling a bunch of stuff. And, artfully compromising, so he, welcome, he, he, he welcomes the church back in, he gets rid of the old, the old deal that had existed previously, and he says, no, 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 
Um, actually, the state is this, the, the, the state needs religion, and we need to understand what we, where we each one is coming from. And your privileges need to be safeguarded, and my prerogatives need to be safeguarded. And hey, on the polyam, um, and so they do that. And so, um, and then there's all, then the 19th century is the other thing that's in the box. It's all just technological innovations that are coming along. So railroads, telegraphs, all the rest of that stuff. Uh, so. So then, this will all be posted, I'm going to just fly through. So the impact of the Enlightenment, so it pushes for these points that I just said. Um, it, secularism becomes a key element. Right? I want to push that pretty hard. Um, the role of the Freemasons as a, as a pro-reform group. Anti-clericalism becomes an object you know, of the, a principle for the Reform Party, particularly the more extreme members of it. Anti-religious societies. There's our Masonic device. Um, the military fiscal revolution. Legal reforms. Here's the here's the biggie. French code law. So French code law exists all around the Mediterranean. In some places, it's introduced by a bayonet. Italy, Spain, um, Portugal. In other places, it is freely adopted by other Mediterranean rulers. The Ottoman Empire, Egypt. Right. Also by a bayonet. French law, French law is introduced into Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Right? Um, and and, and so, so my point here is the Middle East is not other. The experience of the Muslim Mediterranean is not other. Some places have had it thrust upon them. Some of them have had councils of, of, of elites decide that we want to introduce this reform package. And they're not who you think they are. And actually, the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century with the Tunzi line um, actually has a lot of money. Here's Italian and Ottoman civil code. Yeah, same civil code is introduced in the Ottoman Empire, wow. right? And 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 in uh, and in Egypt, right? The variations, particularly family law, marriage, divorce, um, is is an obvious cutout. But that happens everywhere. So everywhere there is code law, family, um, marriage, and divorce are treated separately or sensitively, depending on local needs. Administrative reform, so the idea of the prefect, the idea of the department, the département, the arrondissement, all of that stuff. They have them in Italy, they have them in Spain, they have them in Portugal, guess what? They also introduced them to the Ottoman Empire. Um, higher schools, the Grand École, as they're called, the École Polytechnique, the École Normale, the teacher training school par excellence, the École Normale, the École Polytechnique. Um, and then all these other ones, Mines and Mines, the School of Mines, School of Bridges and Highways, um, the School of Arts and AK, right? And so, it, and it's pushing engineers to the fore, right? All of the, this, a couple of techniques introduced under, I think it's Mahmoud in, in the Ottoman Empire, under Muhammad Ali in Egypt. Um, and there's an Italian one, I had a picture, I mean, I actually flew by the picture of the Italian one. So, um, so the Ecole Technique idea, Ecole Polytechnique is introduced in the early 20th century in Iran, and under colonialism, sorry? Sorry about that, 1850, there you go. So, uh, and, and in Tunisia, you know, what have we done? Uh, so, the, so the Ottoman experience then, the reforms in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, here we are in, in stoppage, <coughs> The reforms in the, in the Ottoman Empire are, uh, are actually the reform. Once they get their knickers out of being in, in a twist with the auspicious event in 1826 when the Janissaries are massacred and the Janissaries alliance is sort of put aside, reform can proceed apace in the Ottoman Empire. And it does with you know, a certain amount of messing around by its European um, powers that are beginning to intervene and trying to, um, uh, you know, affect the outcomes in certain ways. But so the, the Ottoman experience with reform actually is there's the block road to change their way. The Ottomans actually have a well, somewhat bumpy but still relatively clear road. They introduce a constitution, there is an assembly that is elected in 1976, and there's popular protest and reactionaries take over under Abdul Hamid. Um, but then in 1908 um, there's a reintroduction of that constitution and it made the, the introduction of a major um, new Ottoman uh, constitutional monarchy under the Young Turks. So the experience of the Ottoman Empire is actually a very interesting one to look at alongside of the Iberian, French, and Italian experiences. So if you're looking just at the political toolbox, that's the thing I'm setting, so, selling here. 
Um, this is how it goes. And the Egyptian experience is largely in parallel. Um, and eventually this ends us off, and I'll just end with this slide. So we're flying through here. So the secularism comes to the Ottoman Empire, um, and, and then it comes to modern Turkey, right? And so the legacy that we're in secularism. And so one of the places I would end my, my class, and I will end this lecture, is with the specter on the one hand of, of um, the left in Spain massacring priests and nuns and burning convents and monasteries and, and desecrating churches and so on in the pursuit of this crushing of religion, which is seen as the support for Franco and the right, at the very same moment that uh, under editor, um, members of the ulama and the Sufi orders are having their beards shaved, are having their, um, their uh, fezes knocked off their heads, and are being um, made fun of in the street by Ataturkian bully boys. Right. So if you want to find a real descendant of Voltaire and the Mediterranean, Ataturk's Turkey is the place to walk. And it's a twisted path how we got there. Thank you. The idea is, in some ways, this is the, the challenge, right? Of looking at the Mediterranean, and particularly the Muslim bits, through this kind of a lens, is to say, well, so okay, so let's ask the Bernard Lewis question: What went wrong? So is the answer Islam, which is the answer he would give, or is it a more complicated, historically grounded answer? Right? And so how do you? When? At what point? Does religion become come back? Right. So, because second part I didn't get to, to do, uh, which there is not an emerging literature on, is that secularist thought uh, becomes more and more normalized in the Ottoman Empire and in, and in uh, and in North Africa, particularly not just with elites who, where you'd expect it, right? But there are uh, the organizations of Masons. You know, are widespread, and Ataturk is a Mason. A lot of the young Turks were Masons. Um, many individuals were Masons, some of whom were ordinary citizens, right? They weren't all elite members, right? So that's a sort of democratic forcing ground. Uh, and, and then the working class organization, because there's working class protests in response to these changes, right? So it's not a lay down. And the reforms, the reforms are always contested by different groups. Right, so it's a dynamic, and the other thing I'm trying to sell is the dynamic approach to thinking about the history of the 19th century. Um, and that means you've got to bring in workers and peasants, which I didn't have a chance to do here. You could read um, my piece, which is posted um, in the Journal of World History, uh, for some of the things I think about that. But, the, but anarch anarchism, uh, an anarcho-syndicalism, is the principal form the working class movement takes in the Mediterranean, not only in European lands, in Italy and Spain and France, and, and and Portugal, but also in Ottoman lands. So coal heavers, dock workers, a whole host of other construction workers, a whole host of other workers. Juan is one of our uh, experts on this. Um, in Egypt and elsewhere, um, are play a role in the creation of a, of a rather feisty and somewhat contested um, Egyptian working class, in which um, workers are learning from people off stage, so a lot of Syrians, Lebanese, etc., go off to the New World, to places like Brooklyn and Havana and Sao Paulo. Um, and they then write in Arabic, in newspapers, uh, that eventually circulate back into the Middle East. And they talk about their experiences with working class organization in Cuba, the United States, and, and Brazil. Um, and so anarcho-syndicalism comes in that way, but it also comes in on the job site, where Greeks and Italians and others are, are vying for places in a construction crew alongside of Egyptians. And so the idea about this, ideas about the strike, about worker rights, et cetera, all comes, via, comes in this fashion. So the Mediterranean is part of a world at the level of workers, as well as of, a, of, a, of an internal circulating space of, of, of uh, protests and ideas. Um, uh, Ilham, uh, Makhtisi, uh, I-L-H-A-N-N-A-K-T-I-S-I, um, has written a wonderful book that is a reinterpretation of these years through this particular approach. And, uh, 
and it's uh, you know, and so so one of the places the Middle East field is trending in its reappraisals of the of the of the sort of the cultural group that gave us the um, gave us our nationalism is to see that within it there are other elements who are pushing in somewhat different directions who are not all coming out of an elite position at all, um, and uh, and so. So then you went, you know, so now we're back to the Bernard Lewis question. So what did go wrong? That's the thing that needs to be discussed. And it's a, and it's a complicated thing. What is the place of American imperialism in this going wrong, right? What did, why was the United States supporting the Muslim Brotherhood? Why was it supporting Saudi Arabia? These are questions that need to be asked. Go ahead. Uh, I, I believe I know what, what, what went wrong. Uh, I often empire the Ottoman Empire came with the Inkishari uh, army. The Inkishari army was not allowed to get married or have any relationship, so they were all single men. And we all know, we all adult enough around these tables to know that when you take the woman out of the men's life, they become brutal, they become, um, they lose the soft part of, of themselves. So these army went and did awful things in the, what I call the Arab world, in the, all the empire. And that's why they were stronger, closer to Turkey than, I mean, the Ottoman Empire were, close, were stronger, closer to, Tur to Turkey than the uh, um, Northern Africa. And by doing this, they imposed a culture of hardship and roughness and all that. And if you really think about it, and that and they took the education too. They took the education and they took the woman role from that region's part. And that's when the extreme covering of women and so when the men were leaving the house to go into excuse me, their daily work, they were faced with rough environment. And if you think of the hours, people spend at work, it's long hours. So they come back home and impose that on the family, which is everyone there, and take those two parts, you know, from mm -hmm. any society and see how you could really kill it. So we're still paying for this today. We, we're getting better at it. And when the European came to, to the Ottoman Empire and they controlled those countries, they didn't have these kind of thoughts. So actually, I personally met so many Arabs who say the best thing happened to them were the occupation by the French and the British because they felt free. I know I'm taking so much time, but I feel it's, it explains so many things happening today in the Arab world because when we see it, when you read Islam, Islam does not oppress. When you read Christianity, same thing. When you see these things aren't written anywhere. That's why I felt, you know, I, um, I've been observing this problem all my life to find what I'm just so, sorry, we need to um, know, keep yeah. our schedule going and we're already over time for our break so that we can have the next lecture. We have time to discuss this afternoon, you know, more of these so, but I, I do want to thank you for the question because if what it does is it plunges us into a very different work, thought world and a different way of thinking about the changes and, you know, whether they're a good thing or a bad thing. And uh, I, I think that the jury is very much still out on that one. I'm not necessarily a partisan of reform. Um, and, and indeed, the history of the anti-reform movement in the Ottoman Empire is one that still remains to be written. Right? So, there's a, so, there, the, so there is that. But what you pointed to, in particular, is a, is a sort of gender dynamic that gets introduced, right? Which is and not... Roughness. They sorry? Take, take the 
taking this office roughly right. the relationship. No, and that's and that's a, and that's an aspect. Excuse me. So that's an aspect of the way in which modernity is experienced, not just in the Middle East but elsewhere too. So going into factories, learning to conform to the regimens of factory line production, etc., has a similar kind of an impact on, on, on people. And the, and the Mediterranean is a space in which there very much is a big gender dynamic and and and, and a kind of a blowback, and I talk about this a bit in my, in, somewhat inadequately, I think, but in my, in my paper as well. And I would, I, I would sort of leave us with this notion that, that um, if we think about the Mediterranean space and think about where women get the right to vote first, the first place they get the right to vote is Spain. The second is Turkey. The first, the first place was in the, around Prophet Muhammad's time. Well, because the women were allowed to go to war and do all kind of things, men and women were at war. Right, but in the 19th century, so yeah, that's 19th the, century. the actual direct vote in, the, in these forms. I need to be the evil timekeeper um, okay. because they have a right to their coffee break and we need to so keep our skills going. Come on up, I'm here if you want to talk to me, I'm here. Yeah. Right? So I've had my coffee already. So. <laughs> but I still have a voice is another question, but we can always look around that. Yeah.